Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host Sana Makul with you at BTV World. As always, we have some really important issues to discuss in the debate and we try and bring to you all the different angles of the story. Um, there are not so many angles on this story that we are discussing today because uh, what we are going to be talking about with regards uh, to a country um, and its habitual um, stances and steps that it takes um, don't really have uh, much perspective to offer except the sole one that we keep on seeing and it's repeating itself again and again um, uh, what's funny is that now it just uh, is not shocking anymore uh, but it continues uh, to uh, make sure uh, that something or the other in line uh, with its ideology and strategy keeps on going on and uh, the, the world um, the people in Pakistan and the world over are again and again subject to what um, it's uh, the, the kind of efforts that it's making which is borderline ridiculous we also see um, with regards to India um, uh, that not only um, is the regime in India uh, moving towards um, human right violations an ideology which is very obvious and apparent um, to have an inherent bias all over the world but also now um, blaming Pakistan uh, for the actions that it itself uh, continues to make. Um, we all know that India has been exposed with regards to a coordinated media propaganda campaign um, uh, with regards to sp spreading false information and um, strangely enough it has blamed Pakistan for the same. Uh, its ministry has issued two orders banning uh, websites and about 20 uh, YouTube channels claiming that um, fake news is being spread, propaganda is being spread against India uh, particularly with regards to to the situation in Kashmir um, and other parts of India as well. This, of course, is, is what has been coming out uh, from the Indian government and Indian media. Uh, they have also, for the first time, invoked the emergency provisions um, in the information technology rules. And they've spoken about how uh, Pakistan's uh, different channels um, continue to talk about uh, movements in Kashmir um, and spreading false information against India. Uh, of course, the world knows that uh, in fact the opposite is true but we'll still um, for the record try and explore and see what are the claims that India is making um, what sort of rules um, has it invoked um, which uh, channels uh, that it claims uh, hasn't been targeted and what really is the false information since um, everything uh, that Pakistan keeps on actually advocating or talking about is quite apparent and obvious to the entire world Similarly, we will also be taking a look at actions in India with regards uh, to its um, defense and military positions. Uh, we know earlier uh, we discussed uh, the acquiring of S-400 missiles um, uh, that India has uh, incorporated within um, its defense system. Um, now, uh, th this uh, particular missile system is being deployed in the Punjab sector um, with regards to uh, countering threats that it says it faces from China and Pakistan. Um, we have uh, initially also tried to uh, deconstruct the kind of capability that the S-400 missiles have, what it offers for India and what it means of course with regards to uh, China and Pakistan and the kind of threats that India keeps on talking about whether or not um, these, uh, pr these procurement of these missile systems is going to result in sanctions by the US is also another area that we are going to be exploring further. And then, of course, all of these moves in line with what India is doing overall, uh, both within the country against its own population, against Muslims, Christians, Sikhs and other minorities and the stance that it gives out in the world. What really um, is going on in that regard and the kind of response that we're seeing. We'll talk about all of these issues in further detail uh, with, of course, our two esteemed panelists who are always with us in the debate, Mr. Farouk Badafi and Mr. Raja Faisal. Uh, thank you very much for being with us um, in the show as always. And for the first part of the discussion regarding the banning of YouTube channels, uh, we have been joined by an expert who's a senior analyst. Uh, Mr. Hamid Khan uh, will be with us in the debate to talk further on this as well. We'll update you as soon as he joins us in the show. Uh, when we talk about um, the kind of efforts that India has been making, um, Faisal and Farooq, we um, can't help uh, but uh, laugh or smile a little, a little on the kind of efforts uh, that they continue to make. Uh, uh, it's, it seems uh, quite ridiculous that whatever India actually uh, is doing, whatever is becoming more and more obvious to the world, is what it blames Pakistan to be doing. Faisal, what do you have to say on that? Sana, it's uh, obviously it's, it's quite funny to even talk about it that India is banning the channels. But of course, the channels which are uh, of the concern right now, uh, 
you know, there are uh, 18 channels plus two of the websites and uh, uh, among them channels, uh, as India claims that they were propagating against, uh, uh, you know, whatever was going on in the farmers protest, then uh, uh, Kashmir uh, movement, hmm. they are the channels which are highlighting. And we know for the fact that uh, on YouTube, you have several uh, channels that are actually doing it. And uh, they have uh, millions of uh, followers. Uh, it's like uh, one of the channel of Najmul Hassan uh, Bajwa. That channel has, uh, I think, around uh, 0.7 million followers hmm. from uh, India as well as Pakistan and overseas uh, elsewhere in the world. So I think these channels, they were uh, reporting uh, on each and everything and they are uh, reliable channel. But when it comes to you know, India, of course, India doesn't want it. India wants these channels banned because they think that these channels are propagating against them. What are they propagating? They are only propagating the truth. If we look at uh, the other channels, few of the channels, they are uh, purely working about the Khalistan movement from Canada, from Britain. And of course, them channels, they were reporting on each and everything, whatever was going on mm -hmm. uh, in India in recent times related to uh, farmers' protesters, protests as well. So they, India does not want its people to know about the truth. Why? Because we know that Indian channels right now, around 99% of their channels, they are the ones who are funded and being run by the state itself. I'm talking about the private media owners as well. I have the uh, you know uh, experience of sitting in their channels. I know all of the time, 24/7, they are propagating the uh, right. the but propaganda course, which is given by their own Absolutely, Professor. State. But the same claims are being made by India with regards to Pakistan. Let me also include uh, Mr. Hamid Khan in the discussion, who's now joined us in the debate. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us today. Can you hear me? My player, Sana. Right, uh, Mr. Hamid, we of course are talking about um, India's decision and claims of uh, banning uh, different channels in Pakistan on YouTube and to websites as well uh, with regards uh, to uh, statements coming out in terms of false propaganda campaign or spreading fake news. Uh, this of course uh, is something that India um, has been exposed of doing. Um, a lot of the websites, media campaigns run by India in a coordinated effort um, has been exposed, not by Pakistan in fact, by a third party. Um, and now we see that India is putting the same blame game on Pakistan. What is the basis of these claims? If you actually analyze the kind of content they're talking about, isn't that just the obvious truth? Uh, thank you very much, Sana. First of all, I would say I'm surprisingly uh, happy as well that they did not ban mine or Raja Faisal's channel as well uh, so far, because we know that we will give them the right evidence of our news and sources as well. Secondly, uh, to be honest, if we talk about the Indian, uh, I should say, panic, this shows their, uh, how much panic there are in India now about the uh, movements which are going on in India, whether it is the Khalistan movement, whether it is a movement in Assam, whether it is the movement of liberation uh, of Jammu and Kashmir. So, I mean, if India is thinking that they will be able to, they will be able to stop or they will be able to take any, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, 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 cutting them out from the other media, it is not possible because the world media is, is openly telling the truth now. And uh, if India will try to hide the facts from their own public, it's not going to be in their benefit. And secondly, I'm, I was working on a few research in last two, three days, and Indian channels are itself saying that there is no way that India can stop these channels now because there is a technology of VPN, there are, there are other resources. So rather than trying to blame Pakistan or trying to stop the news coming to, uh, to Kashmir or anywhere else, India has to work on stop the, uh, the atrocities in, in Kashmir. India has to stop the atrocities in other uh, you know, states. And on top of it, we have seen the separation and Khalistan election in, in uh, Birmingham here. And there are thousands of Sikhs who are participating and voting for the Khalistan. What India will call that then? The thing mm -hmm. is, if they want to build a narrative that uh, this is a fake or false news, it's not going to in favor of India. They, India has to face the reality. And the reality is this, that Indian media itself is, has no credibility because of their false news because of bringing the fifth story in uh, on uh, 
what they call in Kabul uh, uh, Serena Hotel or because of uh, showing the video game clips and blaming Pakistan. Absolutely. This is Absolutely, the level Mr. of Hamid. And I agree with have. you. I agree that that's uh, the reality. But uh, Farooq, do you think that people in India, the, the kind of population that perhaps the Indian media is targeting, um, really also believes in this reality or is not going to be impacted even if perhaps uh, whatever India is saying with regards to the channels uh, uh, in Pakistan or the information coming from Pakistan, um, even if they can't back it, they, they still impact the opinion of the people in India, don't they? Right. Uh, Sana, that is a, a very important question so far. Uh, because we know uh, uh, since 2014, when Narendra Modi came into government, uh, we knew that something or I uh, was going on, right? Hmm. Uh, but after that, uh, uh, because uh, there have been many shocks to the international system, um, uh, what with Trump, what with other uh, other parties around the world, uh, we uh, a question was being asked: which dystopian line? or timeline are we in, right? Hmm. One is, of course, Orwellian, where the information is controlled and people are subjugated. The other one was Aldous Huxley's uh, uh, Brave New World, yeah. where information is uh, actually so much information is used uh, as a distraction. So the question was, uh, which uh, dystopia is India becoming? And now the answer that keeps on coming is uh, very interesting both of them. Uh, the uh, Hindu class uh, is actually, uh, you know, Brave New World, uh, Huxley's uh, world. And uh, when you talk about the minorities, when you talk about the marginalized people, they are living or billion uh, dystopia. <coughs> and there is manipulation on both sides. Uh, when you talk about the Hindu uh, government or Hindu, uh, Hindu parts of society, particularly the upper, upper class and the upper middle class and castes, uh, there they keep on actually giving this impression that India is under siege and that uh, the Muslims uh, uh, around the world, the Christians, other minorities and Sikhs also, by the way, they are, uh, uh, you know, plotting against India. So too much of uh, that kind of overload. And when you talk about the marginalized people, their access to information is gradually and constantly being curbed. Um, uh, so uh, uh, is it going to have an impact or not? Hmm. That is an interesting question because uh, earlier when I read the news, I was skeptical, right? Uh, because uh, one, the first uh, uh, report that came to my hmm. site was actually coming from OP, uh, OP India. Hmm. which is uh, uh, basically a propaganda mouth of uh, a front of uh, the Hindutva uh, groups and they are hate posters, right, basically. But then I saw that this story actually spread to other websites and other uh, information bases as well. So we know that this ban is uh, going to take place. The second reason why I was skeptical is uh, because of the nature of platform and technology. You cannot actually hmm. uh, pick and choose uh, which channels to actually close. Either you have to go back to the source and ask them to shut down the, uh, the YouTube channels, or then you have to, like we did back in uh, 2000, uh, I think 11 or 12 or 13, uh, I think it was 2013, uh, when we uh, blocked YouTube for a bit, right? Uh, so this couldn't be done. But then I realized that because India is very influential, they also do another thing which is called shadow banning. Mm -hmm. That means that in a, a particular geography, mm -hmm. they can actually uh, ensure that certain channels are not recommended to people. And mm -hmm. when you actually uh, try to access them, it becomes really hard very unless they are, they are people who are subscribers. Yeah. So uh, there, there is this uh, element that uh, earlier uh, our brother here also mentioned that how Indian media is being controlled. But compared to Indian media, the kind of uh, hate that you see on their YouTube channels, Indian YouTube channels. Mm. For example, there are uh, uh, certain groups uh, called Doggy something and others. They, they actually actively air or, uh, uh, you know, place, uh, uh, you know, this bidding war on Pakistani or Indian Muslim women's faces and their pictures, right? Mm. That kept on going and that was uh, so much so that they actually created an, uh, an app and mm. they launched it on App Store. Mm. So at this moment, the kind of hate and the kind of manipulation that is going on in India, I think it is beyond any authoritarian state. 
right. because they are mentally manipulating their people to such an extent hmm. that it is, I mean, Hitler becomes right. uh, uh, something very pale in comparison. Uh, when I, uh, you come back, I'm going to uh, give you information about other websites Sarat. as well. Sure. But at this yeah. moment... Yes, Farooq. Uh, uh, let me also again, uh, involve Mr. Hamid once again. Uh, when, we, when we talk about the Indian population and the kind of targeted influence and campaign uh, that they witness, um, perhaps that is understandable as Farooq explained. But what about the world community at large? What about the international opinion? Uh, what about the people who are constantly talking about um, fake news uh, being a concept that we all need to strive against? Um, be more mindful and careful of the content that we are sharing, the content that we're consuming. Um, uh, does these issues actually come under discussion whenever uh, such topics are raised and issues discussed? Because then this is um, the real time um, factors that are actually contributing or acting on these issues. Um, is something being done about that? Because it seems whatever India does is met with no consequence. Uh, Sana, the thing is that as Patafi Sahib is saying as well, that India try its best to use its influence everywhere. And, but there is no doubt that the hub of the fake news at the moment is India itself. Whether we take the example from EU Disinfo Labs report, which exposed 550 media houses working for the fake news against the propaganda against Pakistan, China, and Islam. And then there are many other reports from United Nations and humanitarian organizations that how India is manipulating the facts and how India is using like uh, PowerPoints and other tools to bring, uh, you know, misguide the whole world. But I mean, I will just say two things. One, that if India thinks that this way they will be able to misguide the world, it, it, it cannot last longer. I mean, the, uh, there are other media houses which will keep exposing India's real face. And yes, there is need to be done that European Union and the other media organizations should take a practical uh, steps against uh, this kind of uh, information uh, coming from India and this kind of, uh, of uh, government-sponsored, operated, uh, you know, fake news media houses from India. There needs to be action taken against them. And on the other hand, if you look into the entire situation, like shadow banning, uh, Mr. Patafi was mentioning, it is absolutely clear they have banned some songs for in support of six farmers. And that, that songs were uh, uh, sang by few of the Pakistanis or uh, British Indian singers. And they banned them in India. So their tolerance level of this Hindu Tawa government and Hindu Tawa ideology is at the lowest level. They do not have any tolerance. They cannot, uh, you know, even speak or listen about anything which is uh, give them freedom of speech or, uh, or the, the disagreement. They cannot hold it. They cannot handle it. One thing, I mean, one way or the other, I always say that if there is a fake news, it should be discouraged. Even if it yes. is from any YouTube channel, if it is from any sources, we, uh, we will never support the fake news. But we will support the right news and the right of people to have the access to the right news. Especially in Kashmir, they have done a complete media blackout, whether it is internet, whether it is radio, whether it is newspapers, whether it is TV channels. What is, what is India trying to punish the people of uh, Kashmir? Eight million people and they do not have the access to the basic human rights. I mean, hmm. internet has been considered as the basic human rights according to the European Union resolutions and the European Parliament. So it is like a basic right as a water or food. Is internet is one of those rights. And this is the right which has been deprived by the Indian government for the Kashmiris. India has to be answerable for depriving the basic rights of media as well. And one way or the other, I believe that these 20 channels, I was talking to another channel about that on India, and I said to them that, do you really think that it is going to make any difference with the resistance movement, with the freedom movement going on in Assam or Nagaland or uh, Khalistan and Kashmir? It is not going to make uh, any difference. Rather, it is going to be more intense uh, freedom movement and it is going to be more intense. There will be more channels talking about the freedom of Kashmir, talking about the Khalistan, talking about the Assam, talking about the Nagaland. So India has to do the reality check yeah. rather than trying to stop the media. They have to do the reality check. They have to stop 
the atrocity yes, is what they right, are doing. Yes, right, of course. Yes, Vaisal, you have a question? Yeah, yeah I, not a question, but I just wanted to highlight, uh, uh, you know, another issue which is related to it. Uh, we very well know that with the advent of uh, uh, YouTube-like, uh, you know, portals, uh, it has become very easy for the enemy to propagate within our own ranks as well. Uh, I would exactly. give you an example that uh, I, uh, through my source, I know that there is a probe going on mm -hmm. uh, discreetly. And of course, very soon we would be seeing that, uh, you know, an another nexus, YouTube nexus would be uh, deciphered uh, of such people who are uh, in Pakistan and uh, spewing their venom against Pakistan, against the institutions of Pakistan, yes. and yeah. how they are doing it. Uh, and what nexus is helping them? We know that uh, population of India is obviously a huge population. And if we look at the YouTube users of India, they have a huge number of users. We have a nexus and we uh, obviously, uh, you know, Pakistan is deciphering that. Uh, there is a nexus within India that is helping out such elements yes. of our Pakistan that are sitting on uh, YouTube channels whether they are in uh, Pakistan or whether they are living abroad somewhere, their channels are being helped by the communities of uh, the channels which are existing within uh, India, how they are doing yes. it. They are promoting their channels indirectly. Uh, gone are the days when the spies and when uh, you know uh, these sort of people who are working against their own country, they will be paid by dollars or anything like that. Nowadays, what they are doing is they are telling them, okay, we will promote your YouTube channel, we will give you subscribers, we will give you, you know, you will get your uh, silver uh, YouTube uh, uh, paper very soon, Bad. and then we will be giving you lots of uh, subscribers so that everyone is watching your uh, uh, videos. And what they do is they, they put their uh, videos on the community of certain channels that are having subscribers more than 1 million, then what happens is obviously the people who are spewing venom, they get views, they get money straight from YouTube, but that money is just because of uh, the nexus sitting in India. And nexus like Shirivastwa, nexus like, uh, you know, this kind of nexus is nothing in front of that. They are sitting in India and, of course, uh, using uh, uh, some in Pakistan, some in Europe, some sitting in uh, America and Canada. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, the same game, the same propaganda is going on out there. Farooq, with, with right. regards to what uh, we can respond in terms of um, such measures taken by India or what really needs to be done, um, do you think that perhaps uh, whenever such an issue arises, there needs to be um, some sort of judgment made by an impartial body or these platforms such as YouTube need to be engaged and what sort of content right. um, needs to be put on? Or should we just play the same game and actually counter uh, with, with, with the kind of uh, truths that we need to uh, call out India on? Right. Um, uh, but there are two approaches, of course. One is banning things um, or actually putting people behind bars. Uh, one, uh, a, a, an enemy is going to exploit your weaknesses mm -hmm. no matter what. Mm -hmm. It is your responsibility to never grow that weak, right? Sure. Uh, but uh, the best way to counter all these matter matters, and I keep on telling people that I belong to ec the economist school of thought, where instead of actually depriving people of information, you add so much information and you give so much perspective that people uh, can conveniently and comfortably choose Right. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, counting India by uh, blocking websites will not do uh, in my humble submission. But uh, going back to what India, um, uh, you know, uh, what we were talking about in India, uh, my concern is and let me actually read from a quote uh, I was earlier when I was looking downwards, I was pulling up. Uh, one of my own articles where I quoted certain facts. Mm. Uh, for example, earlier, propaganda, uh, he was talking about propaganda and how Indian media is being influenced or controlled. Uh, the reports actually came uh, earlier. First, uh, you, you know about Ar Arnab Goswami and Republic TV, uh, the channel that, that our two guests actually very frequ mm -hmm. uh, frequent, uh, frequently <laughs> go to. Uh, there, Arnab Goswami actually tried to not tried uh, tried to actually bribed uh, the rating agency mm -hmm. and got whatever yeah. ratings he wanted, and and then uh, uh, there is this very interesting aspect 
there are five major Indian news uh, networks. News Nation, India TV, News 24, N Network 18 and NDTV are either uh, uh, indebted to Mukesh Ambani's uh, business uh, uh, concerns or they are owned by some, uh, some people, right? Uh, uh, and it all goes to the influence. But I tell you, one, uh, earlier it was mentioned, and uh, because Google also has an ex-Indian as its head, hmm. let me qualify one thing. I think these are the people who actually left India, and they're very conscientious and loyal to their jobs. So they are not actually trying to uh, get under India's influence. Okay. But uh, uh, frankly, b with the people like Mukesh Ambani, Adani's and others, because now they are actually crossing the threshold of 100 billion club, right? Uh, the, uh, Mukesh Ambani has crossed 100 billion dollars uh, uh, ownership. So they are actually influencing on their own right. And I tell you why Narendra Modi is there. Narendra Modi was brought into the government for what you call Gujarat model, right? Uh, my, you know, Ambani is also from, uh, basically from Gujarat. And do you know what Gujarat model is? Let me paint a pair, uh, you know, uh, give you a, a, a picture, uh, a, you know, word picture about that. When 2002, uh, you know, violence took place, all Muslims were actually, um, uh, you know, removed from their houses and they were actually reduced to hmm. these small ghettos uh, near the dumping grounds, right? There they have been dumping the chemical waste of all the industries. So the idea was that uh, Muslims will be marginalized, minorities will be marginalized, and then they will have this rich um, and powerful image of hmm. India, of uh, Hindu India. So uh, these guys have been actually uh, uh, aiding and abetting Narendra Modi and Hindutva, and now it is going to haunt them as well. But with due respect, I think that the kind of uh, dystopia India is becoming uh, even would turn the Nazis in their graves. Mm. Mr. Hamid, my last question to you before we move on to the second part of the show. When we, whenever we talk about the, 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 the kind of situation that, uh, that is currently we're, that we're witnessing in India and the kind of action that it takes uh, against in, uh, its own people, against minorities, uh, the kind of allegation it puts against Pakistan um, and the kind of regional spoiler that it is, um, we see that all of this seems to be happening um, uh, and with complete disregard to any um, law, any human rights, um, any sort of international norms. Um, and yet, despite that, the, the kind of uh, calling out or cry that we need to see from the international community is not there. Given that the uh, given the options that we have, given all of the factors uh, that we understand that, uh, of course, define these actions by the international community in, in, in terms of political interests and whatnot, um, what options does Pakistan have? Do we just keep on calling out again and again? Uh, do we keep on responding, keep on explaining? Um, and that's it. That's all we have. Uh, uh, you would be surprised that when I was doing my PhD, my research was based on propaganda wars. And I was surprised that I could not find a single legislation against fails and fake propaganda uh, to any extent. And they give, uh, you know, uh, the European uh, legislation rules, American rules. We went into all the legislations, and they were saying that on, on the basis of freedom of speech, we can let anybody to say unless it has been countered. So this right. kind of, uh, you know, mindset has given a lot of liberty to this kind of fake news media houses to do sure. anything they want unless they've been countered. This is the time which I have been clearly advised in my uh, PhD thesis as well, that now there should be a rules and regulations and sentence like Geneva Convention where, because it's all media and hybrid war. So this war has to be taken as, a, as under the war crimes. If somebody Absolutely. is doing a Absolutely. fake Absolutely. news. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Hamid Khan. We have to go on a short break. Your point is taken. Thank you very much for being with us on the debate. Uh, we'll be right back after a short break and we'll continue our discussion for the S-400 missile system. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the debate and we were earlier discussing the situation in India with regards to them banning YouTube channels in Pakistan based on false propaganda and now we're going to move on and talk about the deployment of the S-400 missiles um, on in the Punjab sector uh, with regards to Indian claims of threats from Pakistan and China. Farooq, we had a different show on this earlier as well right. and we were talking about uh, this particular system um, and now we see that it's being deployed in the Punjab sector. Is this really something to worry about? Uh, right. Um, and uh, uh, actually, you're very smart that you started with me because before we went uh, uh, on air, uh, you and I were actually debating and I was talking about how we don't actually follow up on sure. the stories that we discuss. Mm -hmm. Because last time when we were discussing S-400, mm -hmm. there were two things that I pointed out. One, because uh, it, uh, it has never been used in a warfare, hmm. uh, S-400. It might be very elitist and very impressive system. And the second thing is that India has an integration problem. It hmm. keeps on bringing all the systems from all over the world. And last time when I talked to you, I said that next time they want to bring in a Russian hardware, hmm. they should bring in the Russian workforce as well, yeah. because apparently their own guys cannot handle it. Right? I, I, I and, will second uh, you. Hmm. Yeah, sorry. I will. I will second you on this, because uh, no, no. But uh, excuse me, don't uh, snatch my own quote from me. Uh, that day, <laughs> Faisal, you should know better than the, that. The, the <laughs> next day, the uh, CDS actually crashed in a Russian uh, hmm. plane, and that was being hmm. flown by their uh, people. Hmm. Secondly, uh, day before yesterday, we discussed a UNSC story also, uh, where uh, China was blocking hmm. certain information, and uh, the consensus, our consensus was that they should not worry about uh, nitty gritties. They should do something hmm. about it. Last night, they also actually agreed, and that uh, resolution was passed, hmm. and Thomas West actually hmm. quoted it. Yeah. So we should be following. So up on it. Is this some yeah. sort of a curse that whatever comes out of your mouth would become true? Um, uh, the same letter is not a curse. It <laughs> is a boon. I want to give It is something them. positive. Hmm. But uh, if you think that I, I'm cursed, okay. Oh my I can, God. Oh. I can I, I, worry I, about that as well. I want to, I want to yes. join the curse club as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is a counter prediction I have. Okay. Knowing, knowing the facts. I hope not about me. Know, knowing the facts about uh, my enemy on the east, we know that they have a habit of, uh, uh, you know, bombing their own planes, missiling yeah. their own yeah. planes. Yeah. So I am predicting today that if there is a chance of a, uh, you know, scramble or somewhere, then they will be shooting their own MiG 21s and Su 30s and MI 17s. Right. MI 17 happens to be a, a favorite when it comes to you know crashing. Right. So it will be uh, crashing on the hands of S-400. So I think S-400 would be very busy with their own planes. Right. And I, I know is, that your, yes. your guest has joined, but uh, I tell you, we can actually talk about the nitty gritty of that as well, because hmm. you know they, they have two radars. And one radar actually gains information from the surrounding, the other one is meant for deploying, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is between the two, because mm -hmm. warfare mm -hmm. has shifted, you can not only overload from the outside, mm -hmm. but you can even overload through hacking and other means. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have no doubt, and that day also, before the, his plane crashed, yeah. helicopter crashed, mm -hmm. uh, we also mentioned that they shot down their own plane mm -hmm. in 2019, exactly. right? Exactly. So that, that is also true. Unfortunately, India's this habit, um, I told you that India has an addiction, mm -hmm. uh, an import addiction when it right. comes to technology. That continues. Mm -hmm. And that is also showing you that they are actually, because bullies are cowards, yeah. They don't want to deploy it uh, on China border. Right. Mm -hmm. They want to actually Correct. do it on our I, I think right. we, we should is, go towards someone who absolutely. believes yeah. who believes mm. that it's not the gun that matters, it's the man behind the gun that matters. We're talking about Fahad Masood. Fahad yeah. Masood, thank you very much for joining us in the debate. Mm. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. I hope you can hear me this side. 
Yes, we can hear you as we well. Uh, Fahad, with regards to uh, India um, acquiring the S-400 missile system um, and then of course now deploying it in the Punjab sector, uh, Faisal was saying um, uh, that you believe um, in, in terms of the capability of the person who is actually going to be uh, using any sort of a missile defense system. Uh, this is something that we earlier talked about and India claims that it's going to be training um, its manpower with regards to that. Um, but besides these, uh, do you think that with when, when we talk about the S-400 being deployed by India, there are other nuances to the matter as well? Absolutely. The first and foremost thing that uh, the uh, Air Force is doing or the military is doing right now is, uh, on our side of the border, is never underestimating the other uh, or the eastern border or the eastern uh, friend that we have. Uh, we need to have uh, classical thought of uh, ensuring that everything will work from their perspective and that is how we prepare uh, our battle scenarios our war games and the plans that come along uh, the intent behind the action is once again the same we ensure that the uh, uh, accountable air defense of the state and the region is ensured S-400 is a platform that started back in the uh, in the uh, early 80s, to be very candid, when the uh, Russians were there in Afghanistan, they had uh, issues, challenges galore uh, against uh, ensuring that their aerial assets got secured. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the problem that is, uh, or the challenge that they had was the different layers that they required, the low mad, high mad, and the shore ads, um, which are different air defense systems, uh, were not integrated well enough within the other. Uh, so they came up with different versions of this S series, um, S 300 and 400 being the latest acquired by India, 500 in place or in vogue as well. Uh, it has its skill sets, competencies, it has its technicalities, its shortcomings as well. But uh, what is critical is that we understand its uh, uh, capabilities first and mm. shortcomings later. Yeah. Right. So do you think that um, with response uh, to the de uh, development uh, from the Indian side, uh, Pakistan is taking this as seriously as you're um, saying that it should? I certainly believe so. It has been on the uh, cards for a very long time. Uh, we have been looking at uh, scenario situations which can relate to a 100% success rate of the S-400 and then countering it in uh, air to air and air to ground uh, situations. Uh, yes, uh, there have been uh, uh, our brotherly countries, for example, uh, Turkey is already in the process or it has a few batteries there. So we've been reading the situation or the tech uh, from all perspectives possible. So uh, it will have an influence on the balance of power, but what is on the other side? On our side, what are we doing? First and foremost, uh, the um, Chinese S-300 variant that was acquired by the Army Air Defense System is one negation of the fact. Two, uh, we have uh, the JF-17 and the J-10 with their uh, more than potent weapon platforms that are coming up, A to ground weapon delivery parameters or profiles that uh, are undergoing testing as we speak. Uh, hypersonic right. missiles, uh, uh, air to surface missiles that are there on both these um, uh, aircraft will be potent. Yet again, uh, we have the uh, uh, trusty old Mirage with uh, right. its uh, H4 that we utilized uh, in, in the 19th Feb, tw uh, 27th Feb 2019 situation. So right. we have our guards up and we have our uh, steps ready. Right. Uh, Fazab, uh, I'm glad that we are actually studying it uh, uh, so closely because, of course, it is a big development. But here's a question. I understand that between uh, great powers where the distances are big, uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know weaponry might be very useful. But with the uh, uh, geographically contiguous countries like India and Pakistan, where you don't need to uh, always uh, uh, you know deploy a weapon through the uh, you know technological means. I mean, uh, where Pakistan's border ends, Pakistan's territory ends, India starts. 
uh, even a donkey's back can be used to deploy this, even a camel's back can be used to deploy this. Uh, at that moment, do you think that it is going to actually give India that kind of incredible advantage as uh, we are actually reading into it? Uh, well, the uh, air, the air system itself, uh, let's talk of specifics. It has ranges uh, extending in the high mat domain, which is um, uh, high altitude, uh, where uh, the air defense system uh, reaches to about 300 odd kilometers. It has the medium and then the low ranges as well. So if we look at uh, its capabilities, it can shoot, uh, engage aerial targets at uh, greatest possible ranges. Uh, it, the balance of power, if we look at the uh, tactical level, uh, it may not do uh, a lot. Uh, but uh, being an, a, a military aviator, it always rings in your mind that there is something, someone across the border that can engage you at greater ranges. So it will have to be negated in the uh, uh, very wee hours of a situation or a battle scenario or a war-like scenario before you have freedom to operate your aerial assets in both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground situations. Yeah, Fahad, uh, as we know that while, uh, you know, this story came, of course, uh, the Indian authorities, they said that now when we have placed our S-400 along the border of uh, Western side, that would uh, take care uh, obviously, Pakistan side, uh, they said that now we have the right planes to actually look after our uh, northeast, uh, the Chinese side. Obviously, obviously, China is present there and they want to uh, have their planes uh, down there, the fighter planes I'm talking about. Now, can we say from this that India has gone very defensive rather than offensive like we had India uh, in uh, 2019? It was very uh, offensive at that time. Now they are gone defensive rather than offensive. Can we say that? Um, in different uh, situations, different stories that have uh, developed in the recent past from the uh, from the eastern border, uh, there have been uh, politicians as well as military men mentioning that the uh, threat is uh, with China and not with Pakistan, which more often is negated uh, in from both quarters of uh, the subcontinent, three, all three quarters to be very exact. So, uh, to say that they are going defensive offensive on uh, either of the fronts is very dynamic a situation. They cannot uh, um, put their guards down because they have been uh, empowered by uh, American Western tech uh, with their Chinooks and the C-17s and uh, their offers of the F-21, F-18s. Um, so, they are looking at, once again, uh, as mentioned by them, and this is their quote, uh, for a, uh, for a multi-directional war, for a bi-directional war between uh, India and Pakistan and India and China. So that is what they're theorizing. Uh, but considering where we are today, uh, for, to face a single prong war, uh, the assets requirement is one thing. On the other hand, you have to have the will to fight against the enemy. Uh, if you look at our side, the interoperability of the two air forces, which are the major players in the region right now, which is Pakistan Air Force and uh, the PLAF, which is the Chinese Air Force, uh, has been going on for such a long time, uh, just like the examples of uh, Shaheen exercises. We've already yeah. gone through 10 different versions of it. Uh, so we know how they operate. They know how we operate. Right. Thank we you very much, uh, Mr. Fahad Masood. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we're almost out of time and we'll have to cut it short. But thank you very much for giving your time and talking to us in the debate. Uh, with regards to India, of course, um, these surprises and um, different moves that India keeps on making, both with regards to its uh, military um, and, of course, uh, within its policies and against Pakistan will continue to come. But the important fact is that Pakistan still will continue uh, to tell the world its truth, to tell India's truth, uh, but it also upon the international community to also open their eyes and ears and act accordingly and give the consequence that a country deserves. Thank you very much for staying tuned to PDB World.